GDP interview series. Not sure what I think about this music. Let me know in the comments what you guys think. We're doing the futuristic pop from Restream. Hey, have you wondered how you get money out if you do make it big in crypto? How do you avoid taxable events? Because that's what the rich do. The rich do not incur taxable events. They try their darndest to keep the assets that are the most volatile. Why? Because they may go up a lot and then down a lot, but they'll go back up. So somebody who had Bitcoin in 2011, they're happy they have it. They don't care that it went from 69 to 23. They want to see it hit a million and they're willing to go through the process and pay small amount, small percentage to be able to get a bridge loan or a secured loan on their assets. That's what even Elon Musk, who purchased Twitter, he did a huge percentage of his purchase with not selling his assets, with loans. He secured loans from other people for a percentage. He got loans on his assets. So he didn't have to sell his assets. He wanted to keep them. So why do I bring all that up? Well, because today got a chance to interview a guy who I think is one of the smartest in the space and he's open-minded. He's willing to talk to people. I appreciate him for doing the snake draft adopt the S curve this last week where we talked about innovations and boy, was he a fountain of knowledge. This guy's awesome. It's just as Jesse. He's the liquid loans figurehead for marketing. And then he did what he could there. And he said, okay, I've gotten this where it needs to be. And now I'm going to go and I'm going to create something that's going to make liquid loans better. That's going to make the pulse chain ecosystem stronger. Well, how do you make it stronger? You allow people to pull money out without crushing the price. Well, how do you do that? You do what rich people do with their wealth in the normal markets. You allow these traditional systems to come in. That's what Hex was. Hex was this brilliant thing because it was, hey, a new take, a spin on a certificate of deposit. Well, guess what? Jesse has done the same thing. He's working on two things that simultaneously are going to work to allow you to be able to, as Jack Levin says, go to the store and use your hard-earned crypto to purchase something like milk. Until you can purchase milk with it, it's just on paper. It's not real money. So how do we get to that point while supporting the people and supporting their right to be able to sell. And if you support their freedom and their right to be able to do that, well, you can just say, good, that's fine. We just need to be okay with the price being crushed. Or you can provide them other tools to be able to pull their money out without selling their crypto. And that is what Liquid Loans is doing. But there's so much more going on here than just a conversation about loans. There's something called Power City. And Power City is this amazing, amazing, uh, I mean, it's it's got like six or seven different aspects to it, but it's this amazing, um, I would call it a one-two punch where you have liquid loans that's going to help people get money when they need it, but then keep their crypto in the Pulse Chain ecosystem, but then also be able to earn yield, be able to have compounding yield, be able to interact with NFTs and an NFT marketplace if you so choose. They've got Pixel Park, they've got an accelerator, they've got so many different layers to this ecosystem that they're bringing to lay on top of Pulse Chain. Pulse Chain will not be as successful if it is just Hex, Pulse, and PulseX. You'll just have people selling their PulseX for Pulse Chain or selling their Pulse Chain for hex and then another guy selling his hex for pulse chain it's just going to be this circle jerk it's not going to allow people to actually come in and thrive onboarding is going to be difficult it's just going to be the same hexagons the same people that sacrificed we need to get onboarding we need to get the ecosystem alive and well bringing on people individuals and companies and projects and new coins the ecosystem will be alive and well if the people who build want to flock to this. So today's conversation is one that excited me, that I hope is the first of many conversations with Jesse. Just Ask Jesse. His handle is the same. Just Ask Jesse on YouTube and Twitter. Please go check him out. He is worth your time because he will make you smarter. Very honest guy. 
we had conversation. We both love Richard Hart. We had an honest conversation about Richard Hart. What what is going on? What is he thinking? We're gonna try to jump in and, and discuss what we think he's thinking. Do we know? No, we may be totally wrong. But we love Richard Hart. We love Hex. We love the Pulse Chain ecosystem. And you know how you show that? You show it with your actions more than your words. You can ask questions. And if I get unfollowed or whatever, so be it. Asking questions is part of a healthy ecosystem. Building on top of Pulse Chain is part of a healthy ecosystem. This is what we're trying to do here at GDP. This is what we're trying to do with our interviews. Just as Jesse is an amazing interview. This is our second interview and it went well with one exception. The first half, he was in a hotel and it was terrible. I am so sorry, but I actually am going to cut this up and you're going to see the second half first. And it's segmented well where it, it you aren't thrown in the middle of anything. So it is going to be edited in a way where it is seamless and it's fine. But then I will come in and let you know, I'll pop back in with a little uh, editor's note that, hey, this is the half that's very difficult to hear. I have tried my best to fix the audio, but let's get right into the video. Um, but I just want you to know, for those who love Jesse, love me and what we're doing here, you're gonna get the seamless, easy to hear part. And then if you wanna stick around and battle through it, as I was, as I was talking to him, then um, you can listen to the, the unfortunate bad hotel Wi-Fi or whatever the issue was where he was. Um, he made a lot of time for us. Uh, he's, he cut out uh, 90 minutes and he gave us 92. So thank you to him for, for being so great. He had really, really important meeting before and after. And so um, thank you to him. Let's get right into it. Stick around if you want to try to hear the second half. Um, battle with me. So we will see you every week with these interviews. Thank you so much for everybody who's showing the love and liking and subscribing. If you like and you want to show your, your love for the channel, please like, subscribe, share it out on Twitter. It's GDP Crypto Show on Twitter and YouTube. Let's get into it. So first, powercity.io please go check it out you need to check it out um this is going to benefit you at least be aware of what's going on over there um i think the most important page is this it's the docs page and why i believe that's the most important is because it is going to explain really thoroughly what is going on over there and how everything is related like it just a kind of a linear map of um it's their roadmap but also how everything is connected so i am gonna pull up that doc page and here it is and if you look at this page with me you'll notice it goes from MetaMask to Pulse to Core to Flex to their Accelerator, which is a yield compounder. So basically, whenever you do something to earn yield, you can then double down on that yield. You have uh, Amplifier, which is a loan booster. You have the Pixel Park NFT Marketplace. And then it, it this may be a little difficult for you to understand, but that's okay. Because ultimately, over to the left here, you have the power city ecosystem and if you click on each one of these it's going to give you a detailed description of each part of this so the about or vision is kind of the um, overview of everything but then if you go into it and you start clicking on things like core this will give you an introduction and tell you hey core is the central watt token so that that's the main token like pls is for pulse chain um and guess what if you want to earn rewards from staking your watt those rewards are going to come in the form of pulse 
And how do they give out that reward? Well, every time there is a fee paid to Power City, they collect it in Pulse, and then they basically hand out Pulse as a reward for staking your WAP token. So Core is like the Central Park and then you've got a swapping mechanism and you can go down and learn about amplifiers. So this power city ecosystem over to the left is gonna give you info on everything. And the, the one thing that I think is so important for everybody to remember, Jesse really drove home the point of, if you've been in crypto for a couple of years or you're brand new, get to the point where you're comfortable with the word liquidity and then don't stop. Dive all in to understand liquidity. When you're checking out prices and charts, that's fine. Do whatever you feel is best. No, no financial advice here. But you don't understand liquidity. You can't have a good grasp on where a coin is going or how it even got there. Liquidity, liquidity, liquidity. It is all about liquidity. You'll hear Jesse say that. So please, powercity.io. Just ask Jesse on Twitter and YouTube. This team, even from small details like the website, this team is awesome. They are on top of it. This is worth your time. I haven't felt like this since Hex, really. Like since I really started to grasp Hex, I was on the train to try to onboard people. And, um, you know, there's some other coins that really excite me. Um, but as I've dived more in or dove however you say it, into um, Power City and its relationship to Pulse Chain and also its relationship to Liquid Loans. This is amazing stuff. So please, let's not waste any more time. Thank you for listening to this explanation and intro to this interview. I really appreciate you. Let's get to Jesse right now. Jesse was the figurehead of liquid loans. So what I mean by figurehead is he was the marketing figurehead. So liquid loans was very successful. There was about, there's millions of dollars sacrificed and the liquid loans project is going to do something very, very, very important. You have to understand what people in the real world do when they gain, when they amass huge amounts of wealth. And when rich people amass huge amounts of wealth, they don't take their wealth and cash it out. Typically, they will typically, if they have wealth in the form of stock or shares of a company, if it's Elon Musk, he, Elon Musk did not sell a, the majority of his shares. He took a bridge loan or he took a uh, loan on the assets that he could, that he owned, that he could secure. And that loan did two things. It's going to be a lower interest rate and it's also going to be them avoiding the taxable event that trigger. So anytime there is a sale of an asset, that is a trigger. And that trigger is a taxable event. And so if you can avoid the taxable events from occurring, then you only have to pay a small, uh, a, a much smaller percentage than that of what you would have had to pay if there was a taxable event. So Jesse, I was just explaining, um, why liquid loans is so important. Like basically long story short, rich people, when they amass a lot of wealth, they want to avoid the number one thing they try to avoid is the taxable event. And so when they go out and get a bridge loan or a secured line of credit onto their assets, whether it be whatever real estate or stocks, they do that because they want to avoid the tax, that trigger, that taxable event. And they also realize that whatever they're paying, whatever the percentage is or the, the fee for the loan, um, that's going to be a lot less than the taxes. And even if it's the same, they want to hold on th to things that are speculative and have the ability to go up really, really high. Well, I believe Pulse Chain fits that 
uh, type of asset that is going to go really, really high. Could do what Hex has done over two, three, five, ten years. But how do I live? How do I, if I need to get some money out, how do I do that? Well, the bridge loan, the secured line of credit, that is essentially what Liquid Loans is doing. They're providing that in crypto and in the Pulse chain ecosystem. And so I don't remember what we were talking about right before um, you jumped out, but I was just wondering if if you liked that explanation and if you had anything to add to that, that, that explanation of why liquid loans is actually important for people to know, because um, I've always stayed away from loans in my life uh, other than yeah. like a mortgage, but this is very different. Yeah. So fundamentally loans are good if you have wealth or you have something of value already. Right. Okay. So there's a couple there's a couple ways to look at loans, right? Let's say you're poor and you don't have any money. You could certainly take a loan and go borrow somebody else's money. Yeah. Just so that you can live, so you can pay your bills. But then you have to go pay that back. Right. Eventually, right? With interest or whatever, and you still have no money. Right? So that's most people Yes. Most people are broke. And when they pay think of loans, loans, yeah, they think That's they're going to get a loan from the bank or payday loan or something. Right. And it keeps those people in an ever. They're always poor. Right. Yeah. Because they're borrowing other people's money. Rat race. Yeah. Right. Or they're borrowing the bank's money or whatever. OK. That's a bad kind of loan. Uh, you know, for that person. Right. Maybe it's good for the right. other guy. But that's that's bad, right? Because those people always stay below the bar. They don't have money. They have to buy, you know, borrow money from somebody else. But then they have to continuously pay that back, and they always stay poor. Right. <clears throat> All right. So then you have people, uh, exact opposite of that, who literally loan against their own things. Like their own things. They already have value. themselves. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So when you think of Mark. Uh, Cuban, right? Great. Uh, he he literally can take a loan out against his own team, his own basketball <laughs> team, yeah. right? Dallas Mavericks, um, yeah. You know, you think of rich guys that have billions of dollars, and you you often hear in the news, these guys didn't pay any taxes. How right. are they so wealthy and they didn't pay any taxes? And you know, the narrative from one side of the spectrum is, oh, these rich people are are skipping out on the law, you know, they're, uh, they're doing something illegal or this right. isn't fair evading or taxes or yeah. right. evading taxes. Yeah. And usually that's not the case at all. Usually it's literally because they didn't sell anything. They already have, uh, you know, a house over here that's worth, you know, $20 million. And they have this over here that's worth that. And this over here that's worth that. And they have this, some stocks that are worth however many millions of dollars. And maybe they have crypto that's worth however millions of dollars. And they never sell any of it. And instead, the hope is that over time, all their things go up in value. As things have proven to do since, you know, hundreds of years ago, you know. Yep. It, things, even though they go through cycles over time, things tend to get more expensive. So all they do is literally borrow against their own things. Right. And now they have a loan. So like, so if they, they can literally live off of debt because it, they've collateralized this house and they've gotten a loan from the bank against their house and that's what they live on and that's how they're throwing all this money around because they know their house is just going to keep going up in value and they can right. do it again and again and again and they never pay um you know i can't say they don't pay any taxes but they don't pay taxes on their loans and they still have all their things and that's how they're living right right um they're not did, having to, to get did, rid of their things or sell their things to get that money Elon bought Twitter, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but he bought Twitter with the, he got other people involved, but the majority of money he put in, I believe was a loan on his stock. I don't think he sold 
um, the majority of his stock. I believe he bought Twitter with a loan. And yeah, does I that think you're sound right. I think you're right because that's what all rich people right. do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Tim Cook. I remember reading something about him. Same thing. He, um, yeah. So yeah, it, liquid loans is going to be really, really important because if I need, uh, let's say I have ten million dollars technically. Uh, but I need 50 grand out. If I have to sell 50 grand worth of pulse chain, that's going to hurt the price. However, right. if I utilize liquid loans as a same principle to use my money to do one of these good type of secured loans to get what, you know, my needs taken care of the 50 grand for whatever, then that will help me and will support liquid loans so that this is available in the future and then also support the ecosystem so that Pulse Chain's price has better price performance, which is something that we all want. And so I was, I was going to ask what, how does power city, why is power city important? Like why did you basically what I said earlier while you were um, jumping back on is you were the figurehead not the only guy, not the figurehead of the whole thing, but you were the figurehead over marketing in my eyes for like, you were the guy answering the questions for liquid loans and you got it to a point where you could, but then in my mind, basically you saw another need and you saw, Hey, there's a bunch of things that could be built around to support and be right. kind of a <clears throat> sister coin or, uh, uh, we could build an ecosystem here that could right. work. Right. So, so check it out. Right. <clears throat> so I flew the Richard Hart flag for like a long time uh, yeah, yeah. in the pulse chain telegram and the pulse X telegram and the hex telegram. Um, really trying to educate people about this new ecosystem that Richard was building. Right? Yeah. And then, you know, you do realize, even though, you know, you like the guy you're like, but, this stuff alone isn't going to make a chain successful there. You have to have more. You have to have a stable coin. You By have the way, to have... He has said that's not true. Have you heard him say that? Um, <clears throat> it I is don't... absolutely true. So let me give you why. I, I know. Me... I, I agree with you, but have you heard him say that? I was just curious. If yeah. You... Yeah. Okay. Now look, not everyone's right about everything. <laughs> All right. So, um, I don't care what your name is. You're not people. Just you can't possibly be you, right every single time, right? You so, just you just got unfollowed somewhere by Richard. I'm Hart. sure I did. <laughs> I'm just okay, but I'm going to explain my reasoning, right? Please. So you've got these people that all like this one thing, right? This one person, mm -hmm. and they they're like, oh, I like this thing called Hex, and I like this thing called Pulse X. Okay, cool. Jeez. Now, you have this blockchain, and you come into the blockchain, and you say, wow, I can buy Hex with it. Um, but I like this PulseX thing that he created, too. So let me sell my Hex for this PulseX. Simultaneously, somebody else is saying, I'm going to sell my PulseX for this Hex. Mm -hmm. And now you just get this endless teeter-totter. And at the end of the day, everyone's just selling the both things that they like, right? Yeah, um, you know, because that's the only like that's the only thing that he created. But that doesn't actually attract new people to come into a chain and use it. Every thriving chain has multiple stable coins, multiple lending platforms. You have uh, some s stability, some protocols that offer some extra stability to the chain, like Curve and Balancer, that literally balance out all the stable coins and stuff on a chain. Um, you've got like, you've got dog coins, you've got NFT stuff, you've got all these things. And if you want the world to come play, you have to give the tools that the world's currently playing with. Right. Right. If people were going to FOMO into Pulse Chain, okay, let me say it like this. Has the world FOMO'd into Hex yet? No. I'd say no. no. So is low gas 
the reason why the world has not FOMO'd into Hex. No, I don't. I don't think so. No, no, because so, other things have been FOMO'd into, like dog coins, right? So that the, have the same gas problem, right? Sorry, go ahead. So Pulse Chain coming into existence is not the catalyst that's going to cause the world to FOMO into an empty blockchain and pile into one coin called Hex. All right, but what could cause you know, be a catalyst to people fumbling into a new blockchain, at least getting a foot in the door. Um, you do have, you know, the free coin, free airdrop narrative. We have seen how that plays out on other chains. That's wow. not always as good as it, you know, usually those aren't worth very much. And, then, you know, sometimes they just get dumped, right? Free things people like to dump. Um <clears throat> Well, and the by the way, the, we were wondering about hey, are the are the stable coins going to have any value? And we saw how that played out. No, they get they get invalidated. Well, it's not even that they get invalidated. You can still buy them. You can buy millions of them right now on like ETH and ETH Power. Like, yeah. oh yeah, you can spend like a dollar and get like a couple million stable coins. Um. And it's literally because of the way those ratio, the, the the way the liquidity pools work. When the chains first went live, uh, you could come in and one, it, like, so let's say ETH was $2,000 at the time on the ETH chain. Yeah. So one ETH coin on Ethereum was 2000 USDC. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, ETH was replaced with it, with something else, with a different ticker symbol called ETH Fair, Fair or yeah. ETH Power or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. But those were cheaper. But the ratios were the same. So if one ETH is now only four dollars, however, it's still paired when the chain goes live to two thousand USDC. You could bring four dollars into an exchange by one single um it's fair coin mm -hmm. and now you have 2000 usdc in the chain right it was like it was super simple right um so you that could automatically bring tells you the value of the usdc it's just whatever that it's, it's one just, tenth of a penny or whatever right so you can bring you know a thousand dollars into one of these chains and literally get millions and millions and millions and millions of stable coins and then you could have went and raided all the pools and literally got billions of hex or, yeah. or not billions, but hundreds of millions no. of hex out of the pools or, Oh, no. you like, uh, the maker coin. Oh, cool. Give me millions and millions of maker coins. And literally you just become the guy who has all the coins on the entire blockchain. Yeah. Right? I, I believe that's what, uh, right. Jim rat crypto did. He was doing that on fair, I believe. Right. So, so, so check this out, right? So there's this narrative that you've got the fixer bot for Pulse Chain that's correcting the ratios so that that can't happen. Yes. So that that's fixed for Pulse Chain. However, I'm not saying this is right or wrong. I just, I always like to offer you're asking a question. <laughs> Two perspectives on everything. Okay. The entity that runs the fixer bot is doing just as I described in acquiring the entire blockchain. Okay. He's preventing you as the person from doing the very thing that he's doing himself. Right. Right. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Because the hopes is... It's He'll for do a it. good reason to put all the liquidity in one place um, that would perhaps maybe benefit the holders of that those things, right? The, the community members who have shown their support on such a platform like PulseX, right? Mm -hmm. So there's some benevolence that people hope for, you know, in that action where he's, where it's like somebody's taking away your ability to get a good deal so that the good deal can flow into one, like through one entity who is then going to make that good deal benefit the people 
who showed their support, right? Mm. So that that's kind of the direction that all of the things on Pulse Chain are going. Yeah. Well, it's the control. I mean, that's been the story with Hex and Pulse and Pulse X. It's, it's, it's got to have the control. And that's why it was obvious, but even before he did it, that he was going to sacrifice. Um, mm. he, he wanted to have huge uh percentage of the coins and then ultimately the control so what but what but let me be very clear so i make sure i understand what you're saying so when you said i wanted to provide perspective the other side of it it you're you're just saying hey he's not doing any different i don't think i don't it's certainly not for nefarious reasons right no, so no, you no. will have people in the community say well why is that happening um why did a guy come in? You know, why, why did an entity come in so hard on top of us? So, you know, you hear some weird, you know, some things that when you really sit back, sit back and you think really, really hard, what's going on here? Um, oh, okay. He built this platform over here called PulseX. You've got to migrate all the liquidity over there. Like, it all starts to make sense. The deeper you dive down these rabbit holes... Mm -hmm. We don't dive down these rabbit holes because we're trying to FUD. We're, di we're diving down these rabbit holes because it's just better to understand. That's all. Yeah, and I've said this before. Obviously, there was a change after Hex came out that affected the way that the gas was calculated and ultimately how much it was going to cost to end stake. He would have done the calculation... I believe if I understand it right from what I've heard from other uh, one other individual and what I've read, the referral program is what is is the large portion of what is making the in stake so problematic when gas is high. It's actually the referral. There's code from the referral program from the first year that is it that that is. Um, making uh there so much to calculate when uh in stake occurs and so if he would have known that he pr probably would have fixed that or ostensibly i i that's what i believe but if if i think through it i think hey he probably knew he wanted a layer one but he knew you have to start with the, the easiest way is to start with this coin that is going to provide um you know, uh, a service on the blockchain that has real world application, although it's very different. It's kind of like, um, a, a, uh, certificate of deposit, very volatile, but it's going to get people to do similar things, lock up stake. It's going to be, a, uh, the best of the staking coins, but then he's not going to make money off of hex, but I fully believe everybody wants to make money and that that's okay to say, but I, I think it was always a, multi-tiered plan and it was going hex and then it was going to be a layer one and then who knows what else he made all that money in step two and three of the plan and it was through well, the sacrifice mm -hmm. and i've always thought that plan probably was in his mind as either a I pipe think, dream or i think an a idea. i think a blockchain was always in his mind even before hex yeah when you look at pulse chains url uh you can see that it was uh, like registered about the same time X was even created. Oh, interesting. That's right. A good so, idea. and yeah. and Richard's been in blockchain a long time, or at least in crypto. You know, he says you know mining Bitcoin early on. Twenty eleven. Yeah. I do think that he probably always you know thought about how do I build a blockchain. You know, eventually I'm going to do this. I think maybe Hex was a catalyst, like where he's like, okay, let me get my act together and get this thing going. Right. Yeah. But I don't think that Hex is the reason he did it to begin with. I think it just boosted him faster to, to get it done finally. That's what I was saying too. I, I think that's a little bit of the narrative uh, from some people and, and maybe even him a little bit, but it, listen, it's a good, it's a good, uh, it's a good story. Hey, things got more expensive. And now I'm going to sweep, uh, swoop in and save the day. And, and if he does it, it will in, in a sense, 
save the day for those who have really expensive stakes and they can't afford it. They'll be able to go over to Pulse Chain. Now, whether or not it'll be the same amount of money, time will tell. Yeah, so uh, you you can't necessarily say it's going to save the day. It's going to like provide another option, maybe. Liquidity makes everything right in blockchain. So Mm -hmm. sure, they'll save gas fees, but then it's like, well, if the liquidity is different. Um, it'd be a different amount of money. They'd be on, on or if people just FOMO in because they think it looks cheap and then you still have, you know, the same big guys that just extract the value. Like, it's like, are we really helping anything or is it just a different network that has the same, you know, different issues? Like, we we don't know. Look, we'll we'll see, I guess. It's going to all play out. I'm I'm not, I'm literally not trying to foot. I'm just saying, no, I I don't. I don't necessarily the way crypto normally works is everybody believes you know one thing's gonna happen and they get due for a wild surprise, you know, and then some you know, then maybe it happens, right? So yeah. you literally have to be careful in this game because it's it's literally everything boils down to liquidity. I, I like that. That's um, something that I've I've heard you say a lot and that I've actually been saying a lot. If you're going to understand one thing, like if you've been in crypto for a while and you feel like, hey, I have a grasp of everything. I can do all the stuff with MetaMask and what do I need to dive into? Because there's so many things to dive into. It's probably understanding liquidity. That'll give you a really good grasp. Mm-hmm. I actually wanted to ask you not about liquidity, but a similar type question. Okay. I feel like I have a decent understanding of liquid loans and a power city, but you know, there's like, there's, there's the watt token. Obviously that's kind of at the center. What is something, give me something I need to understand. Um, that's maybe cool about power city and then something that maybe would blow my mind that power city is going to enable or provide for the community. Because we've talked about liquid right. loans, but I want to focus before you have to leave. I want to focus on Power City. Yeah. So, liquidity over on ETH. Mm-hmm. Awesome, right? Awesome code, right? So good and such. I mean, because it's trustless, it's, it's immutable, uh, no middlemen. It's literally the way that um, you allow people to never have to sell something. And with no with no counterparty risk, it's so good. In fact, that the liquid loans team said, "Oh, we want to copy that." And is it open source? Ver- huh? Is it open source? It is. Yep. Cool. Um, and bring we want to copy that and bring that uh, to Pulse Chain and allow people to not have to sell their pulse. Um, and it's a, you can collateralize, you can take out a loan, you can, mince, you, you know, these stables, you can, you can put these stables into a stability pool, which helps the health of the entire ecosystem. While you're in there, you're earning a reward token that you can go stake and you stake those for the fees because there's fees every time people use the protocol. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of this big closed loop liquidity pool system that self balances based on, you know, people minting and redeeming back for a dollar's worth of the underlying collateral. And it's actually, once you understand it, it's actually really simple, but you have like, you may have, you've heard me break it down before. You know, I have to break down three pieces. Yeah. And once you hear it two or three times, how those three pieces work, it it's like, Oh, I understand it now. And then it clicks and it's like, Oh, okay. This is actually pretty, simple you just have to hear it three times so beautiful system copied over from the liquidity team robert Locko. he um no complaints from that guy right he's actually very supportive of people who fork uh liquidity um <clears throat> all right so that's now on pulse chain and you know i was a part of that team early on for the first year or so built up the community Yep, mm-hmm. and eventually along the way, that same um, 
like you can't have a chain with just one one thing right, right. it can't just be hex and then a trading platform because what are people going to trade for yeah uh you exactly. have to have some other coins yeah right no, I, I don't like dog coins and memes and stuff, but you have to have tools and services. So it's like, well, okay, cool. You got this lending thing. Liquid Loans did a great job with that. Um, so Power City team, what do they have? Well, they have other tools and services, some of which support Liquid Loans and are built on top of Liquid Loans. So you have this amplifier tool that you all those functions that I talked about in the lending mm -hmm. platform, you can auto compound and you can uh, route your claims in any direction that you want to happen inside of this auto compounder. It's, it's actually a great tool. Yeah. It's uh -huh. a, so amplifier is the front end that connects yeah. The, yeah. the, the two together, liquid loans and yeah. power city mm -hmm. amplifier connects them. Now we actually believe, that we're going to bring a lot of traffic through into that amplifier um, in direct support of our, of course, our thing that has really cool, a really cool way to use um, liquid loans protocol to never have to sell because we have a cross chain swap bridge across the multiple blockchains and a highway to pulse chain. But guess what? You're not just going to land on Pulse Chain, and and you you have to do it through our website, through our DAP, through our tool. Which what is it right there? Oh, cool! You've got this amplifier front end for liquid loans right there. Mm -hmm. Now you just created a highway for millions of people from other chains to come directly to this thing and never have to sell their pulse, right? Yeah. Now there's also an in, there's also a community of PulseX holders, and you have to give them some love, right? Mm -hmm. So we took the torch on that one, and we said, well, we'll offer the same ability for the PulseX holders to be able to collateralize their thing as well, right? Um, you you have the bridge, which is huge, and people flow in, and what do they have to buy? They have to buy Pulse on the blockchain that they're going to. But oh, by the way, they saw the amplifier. They remember that. They know that they never have to sell that pulse. You just gave a direct highway to Liquid Loans Protocol through our front end, right? Through our series of tools. Right. And if people are deciding to never sell their pulse X, you could do the exact same thing through, you know, using pulse X. Right. right. And so transformer is the swap what you're you were referring to. Correct? Right. Right. Correct. Trying to get these, so now, I want to be able to mention these different things because there's, it's not, it's not one product. This is a whole ecosystem that basically you guys correct. are creating. Yep. You're solving a bunch of problems correct. that are, that were there, that correct. won't be. It'll be they'll be solved with Power City. Correct. So keep going. Sorry. Now, we also have this thing we call the core, which is where you can take your pulse coins. You can mint some Watt tokens, which you can stake for the fees of all our things. And when you stake, you have an ever increasing share rate over time. You know, as people come in behind you, they can't capture the same rate of the share pool as you with the same size right. position. So that ever increases and it creates this mechanism where it's actually pretty valuable to either just stay in there or just sell your position. You and you're earning your, pulse. That's you're earning what pulse. you earn. And Correct. so, yep. Yeah. Yep. And then I'd heard some, or I saw somebody ask, where does the pulse come from? And I didn't even know. from the fees. Everyone it's pays the fees, fees to yeah. use all our, yep. It's not yeah. inflationary. It's not a weird thing. It's literally people are, if you come through the bridge, maybe you'll have like a 1% fee to come through the bridge. Guess what? That actually uh, gets split where some of that actually goes to our bridging partner who made this all possible and then the rest of it spread to the community right gotcha okay um cool. if you are using our amplifier uh front end it's literally auto compounding and every time it does that for you you know a percentage of that gets shaved off and it goes to the sakers of what right got it. it each of these little auto compounding functions from each of these uh places you know maybe there's like seven transactions that are occurring in one and there's 
you know, it's it's grabbing little fees off of each of those because it's combining them into one transaction. You still save because there's only one gas fee and that's covered, you know, that's handled a different through a different mechanism anyway, but you're still saving because you're not paying all those gas fees, but mm -hmm. you're also saving because you're not sitting there at your computer clicking buttons all day long and it's just running for you. So be, and because of the power of compounding, when you put your your claimable rewards to work for you quickly over and over and over, right? You can actually start to scrape some fees from all of that and you can send those to the uh, stakers, right? So they're, they're constantly earning pulse from all of these transactions that are running, right? So this, I've heard you describe this as, hey, if I have to go on to claim, even if I'm getting rewards, if I have to go on and claim them 10 times a day or once a day or once a week or once a month, that takes up my time. So what we wanted to do is solve that problem while also realizing that the people who have to manually go back there and time the market or claim their reward, their uh, percentage gains are always less because human error. And so the accelerator is where you guys have tried to figure out a way to use a not AI. But basically, where so I you're, claim, you're saying the amplifier, the amplifier. Did I say it wrong? Yeah, yeah, I'm, the amplifier. I, amplifier. Sorry. Yeah. Basically, it accelerates the amount that you're able to make. But I can claim it by I, I can I can because I can have it claimed it, for me. Yeah, because it's auto simply auto doing it off of your preset target. Preset, yes, or your preset range there, right? And. That's one thing that I think is amazing. There's there's a couple things about V3 that I think are like, I, I wish there was an auto, like I wish there was a preset where it could just sell for me. Like I, mm -hmm. I wish there were some things built in that maybe eventually V4 or later on there will be, um, but that aren't there. And I remember as I was reading about, um, reading about this, I was like, oh, that is kind of similar to, to a type of mechanism I would like to have eventually in V3 liquidity providing. So that was a very cool feature that, uh, that you guys, um, uh, had put in there. Um, I, you have to go in like three minutes, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is there anything? So I'd love to talk to you again and go, um, more in depth. I love what you guys are doing. Um, right. is there, yeah, we're going to have to break each one of these down into like, one video. Yeah. Perfect. Like That'd for example, awesome. our bridge, we'll bring KDP in. Okay. And her and I will both, you know, tag team and explain how like why you would want to use our bridge and how it compares to other bridges. Oh, that that would right? be awesome cuz just I... as an example. And then we can do, you know, a different one where we we talk just about our amplifier Flex and why you would want to use it and how it works. That would be awesome. Well, hey, Jesse, thank you so much. Good luck with your meeting tonight. You said you have a meeting with some bigwigs, super important people. <laughs> um, yeah, we have. So, so every now and then, um, it's kind of funny because sometimes big guys uh, they need some hand holding and they want like a special, like they want to get on camera like this in a private meeting, <laughs> yeah. and they want like their own explanation, like in private, right? Yeah. Even though you have, even though even if you have videos like this or a Twitter space recorded, Send they feel more. They don't care. Yeah. They feel more comfortable if you talk to them face to face, right? So, well, um, and but I, we do that for everybody. We do that okay. anytime anybody has any questions. We always jump into our uh, Telegram and we're ready to answer questions. We jump into uh, Twitter and we're answering questions all day long. That's just how we are. I've never seen. Uh... Uh, like, I think you guys are more available than just about anybody I've ever seen. And then I, maybe I just don't know enough websites, but I think your website is just one of the coolest websites. Just the mm -hmm. little details. I don't know who made it. Did you make it? Yeah, we have, we have an internal, like our okay. core team made that. Yeah. Okay. Cause I, I, I thought it was you, like you made the whole thing and I was going to oh, no, say, listen, I'm not, I actually have done some website builds. Uh -huh. to tinker around and i actually got kind of nerdy on that at one point and mm -hmm. and i did some web3 like uh like i own an nft that gives me access to a website that i can that's hosted on uh 
uh, IPFS or whatever. I have done that, but I am in no way, shape, or form good at it, nor am I like a dev uh, or anything. Well, we that have, website's awesome. <laughs> Maybe have, I don't have enough exposure. We have an internal team of, of that. We have an architect. We have um, um, the DAP designer, the mm -hmm. front end guy. Um, and then we have um, some other devs that are uh, super experienced. And we yeah. pulled them um, uh, into our team to 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 kind of put all this together for us. We also have some external teams that have built some things for us. And then we've taken those into our core team to um, look over and get a second set of eyes on. And uh, there's some cool we stuff going on. We actually have a, a large team that is doing all of these things that we talk about. Yeah. I mean, even, even the NFTs, they're 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 they're, they're kind of crazy looking, but they're really cool. And the ones that you guys have on the website uh, that are advertising Pixel Park, and which is your NFT marketplace that yeah. you guys will be launching. Those are also made so by cool. our own. By team. your own that team. Art wasn't just oh, like cool. like grabbed off of the internet. Like some of that is actually drawn out by hand. I'm sure some of it is like AI generated as well. But sure. we have. Like one of the founders on the team, he's he's an artist guy, and he he draws stuff. So wow, um, that stuff's amazing. Like everything you see, like our team is built. It it's what's so cool about crypto is there's like I said the other day on the show, I looked it up, and there's like ten in all the universities throughout the United States. There's like ten crypto classes. So Web three, DeFi. There's some really cool artistic amazing people and if you get the right people together with devs and uh you can start to see things like power city and and, and even pulse chain and um anyways thank you so much good luck and we'll uh, i'll message you i would love to start breaking this stuff down so that uh we have as much info out there for the little wigs and the big wigs <laughs> so they can watch this stuff uh before pulse chain is out so that we yep. can be prepared and and it's all second nature. So anyways, have a good night, man. Uh, just ask Jesse on Twitter and just ask Jesse um, on YouTube. Both the same, right? Um, yeah. Um, or just follow our Twitter at powercity.io. Even better. On Twitter. And then right at the top, it's got some links to our other places where we hang out. There we go. All right. It's right there, right below. Anyways, thank you, man. Have a great night. Travel safe. And uh, we'll, we'll talk soon. All right. Okay, so great interview. Thank you so much to Just Us Jesse. I uh, love Liquid Loans, love Power City. But that wasn't all the interview. I mentioned it at the beginning, but the audio was so bad where he was, and I apologize. But there's just really good stuff, and I wanted anybody who is willing to battle through the audio. I spent hours trying to do some EQ, some balancing, learn different tricks with DaVinci Resolve 18.1. How do I get this audio so it's more palatable, easy to listen to? There's a saying in editing, hey, you can deal with good audio, bad video, but you can't deal with good video, bad audio. Well, we have some bad audio and I wanted to say a specific shout out to uh, one of the commenters who recently said, hey, Here's a tip. You, I'm only getting it in the left ear. And uh, that was an issue in my first few videos. And I've left them up because it reminder of how far we've come and <laughs> all the audio and video issues that we've overcome. Um, so it's a reminder that we've come a long ways and some of those problems are going to pop back up. Audio, all this stuff, there's so much to learn. It can be a real challenge. So I'm very sorry. But I, I am going to link the rest of this because... The stories that he tells are awesome. Just as Jesse is a treasure. He's great in this community, and I'm glad that he's in our community. Um, watch it if you want. If you don't, that's fine. But we're going to try to have him on again, and we'll go over these stories when he's not in a hotel with terrible clipping audio. So stick around if you like. If not, we'll see you in the next. I have three interviews this week. We're going to be pumping them out. Thank you so much for everybody who has stuck to this point and 
I'm sorry about the audio problems, but we'll see you in the next one. Okay, so keep going with what you're saying. Yeah, so there's like a just a lot that goes into you know the team side of things. Um, you know, I think you were asking about sack. I don't know. There's yeah, like three point five million has been sacked yeah. for power. Yeah, so that, you know, I foresee that that's going to go up as soon as Testnet launches, and then we open up our. We're trying to get like four things pretty close to the same time, just launched all at once on the court, like bam. Now, I can't guarantee they're all going to come out at the same time, but we have... What do you mean by that? What, four things? So, we have a cross-chain bridge. Oh, yeah. Okay, got it. That's what mm-hmm. you mean. So, like, Pixel Park... So, Pixel Park's not going to be out for, uh, okay. for, I don't know, five more months or so, right? We've got some more work to do on that thing. Right. Well, we're getting really close on this bridge. Today we got to walk through and uh, went through the the whole front end with the devs since they showed us all the functions and they were doing swaps and stuff. And that's uh, the transformer. Uh huh. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Transformer cross chain swap. Yeah. Um. So that about when pulse chain testnet comes out again, we should be pretty close to being able to launch that. Mm-hmm. Our amplifier liquid loans front end our core and probably our version of liquidity for pulse effects, like pretty much all close to the being the same time. Now, when that happens and the community gets this brick wall of all this stuff, we spent all this time uh, building. Um, I, th- I think that's when people are really going to start paying attention to us. Well, yeah, as soon as the excitement goes up, you'll have more. I, I noticed there was a drop off in the people on the team, including you, just the amount of press or whatever you call it, just the streams that they're doing. And uh, partially, probably, you know, because they're busy getting it ready, right. but there's just this lull. You guys are unfortunately reliant upon Pulse Chain coming out and i would say more v3 as soon as you get v3 sure. you can prepare for the actual public launch right yeah so while we wait for v3 there's always constant tweaking right, right. so <clears throat> like if you look at our amplifier build you know our video of it you'll see all those mm-hmm. tabs up there right yeah so there's always there's always little things that you could do while you wait you can uh you know even just on the front end right so our front end guy he's got a lot of work cut out for him but like we have made changes to the way it looks we completely changed the color of it we got rid of some purples we added some like uh some greenish blue colors in there um and we put like little ghost thing effects around some of the boxes and stuff and we just try and clean it up as much as possible um you can yeah. always do something better. Now, you'll hear Long Vacation say something. If you strive for perfection, uh, or I don't know how he words it. Look, if you demand something to be absolutely perfect, you can get caught up in this as a as a dev team. You can get caught up in this thing where you just constantly build and build and build and build and build, but there's always something more you can build inside of it, and it never gets done. Right. Yeah. So like um you have to manage that and ask yourself what are the goals here? Um what are you trying to allow these tools to do? And don't get too carried away with it all. Right. I heard him cuz I was preparing for this. I was listening um to a couple streams you guys did together and um Yeah, he was talking about that happy medium where you can, you don't want to release things where there are problems. And I mean, we talked about, you made it kind of a joke. People have sacrificed and myself, I've sacrificed for, I I don't know, we'll say 10 things, Um, Mm -hmm. all really within the Pulse Chain community and Liquid Loans. 
your stuff being one of them. And um, I, I do really believe that like I am sacrificing and I, I do believe that especially the time period where this all came out, I don't want to take this channel too political, but the truth is it'll just go there naturally sometimes. And when it does, I'll let it, but there were some things that whether you're right or left that bothered me. And, um, I liked some of the political statements that people stood up and said, Hey, we're going to do this project and it's going to serve this end or this purpose, but we're going to, uh, utilize this tool, the sacrifice, and we're going to do it for this important purpose. And we're going to sacrifice showing, this political statement's important. And I really liked what you guys did because I, my family was so poor growing up and I'm not rich by any means, but I am 10 times better off than they are. And it's because of capitalism. It's because of the free market and my ability to put in lots of time and adapt. And I, I, I haven't been held down by anything. So right. um, I remember really appreciating that because I, I i think uh what pulse chain was freedom of movement maybe i don't know freedom of speech one, one of the two whole sex was the other one and i thought that was good but i remember um thinking you guys nailed it when when i heard uh what your guys the sacrifice purpose was for and um, mm-hmm. what was liquid loans or, or am i getting confused um it has remember. been so long. I don't remember the. Uh, it's okay. What, you know, not, not a big deal. Um, I did have actually a couple of questions because obviously, so most everybody knows you, but um, you are the liquid loans guy. The I don't know. Well, you, can I can I can I back up with that a little? Let's go yeah. even a little bit further. Yeah, let's let please. Um, I have some questions further back. <laughs> go ahead. Um. Well, how far back do we want to go? I suppose. I I did an in, just really quickly. I did an interview with Crypto Profeta, hardcore hexagon, but he does a lot of other stuff. Have you met him? Uh, I have. Yep. Okay, I think he's great. I got into his like origin story about how he just started like uh, like uh, as a little kid, just being a hustler, and how that mindset led him to crypto later on. And people had more comments. They thought that was great. And so we hear about all the stuff you're doing all the time. And there's lots of, there's lots more questions to be answered. And I think that's, that's really the important stuff. But the interesting stuff is what led you to the mindset that made you latch on to crypto? And so those were going to be my questions. Right. Like when, what was the first time you, uh, you know, made money out of nothing, like rich dad, poor dad type stories. But, um, well, I haven't always had money, of course, that everyone you know, unless you're yeah. born into a rich family, you, most people say that, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Well, was there ever a time as a kid where you, you know, flipped something and realized you, you know, you could make yeah. money of hustling? Of course. So <clears throat> I grew up um, playing trumpet, actually. And at first I didn't, didn't like it, you know, but it was, it, my parents wanted me to uh, be in in band, right? So I was a ba- I was one of those little band geeks. Yeah, and, my boy uh, plays trumpet. That's why I left. He just right. started. But I um, somewhere along the lines, I heard this guy, uh, Miles Davis. I I heard a recording of Miles Davis playing some jazz music, and I thought, oh my gosh, like I didn't know that people could. Could be like it could sound like that, right? Sound like that, yeah. So I, I literally just started playing and playing and playing and playing, and I, you know, I'm not a master of of, of anything, but like when I focus on something, I get really good at. It. And I worked my way up to the, like first chair. I went all the, to all these state events, and you know, I was winning these trophies and stuff, and playing in these jazz bands and. Um, you know, sitting in in these college, you know, even going off to colleges and and uh, participating as much as I possibly could, and and then I, I'm like, well, I, I need to learn a guitar, and the first guitar I got from my neighbor who gave it to me uh, for mowing some lawns for him, and he had pulled it out of the trash, 
and it was a broken left-handed guitar. Um, but I already knew how to form the chords on it because I had built myself a little fake uh, fretboard, and I, you know, I had put like super glued down that you couldn't move them or anything, but just for the feel, I had super glued down some uh, some rubber bands, and I was already like learning chords before I even had a guitar in my hand. And when I got this thing, I just strung it upside down because it was a backwards guitar. And within a month, I'm like, I'm, I'm playing some fairly simple songs. And then to this mm -hmm. day, like, I'm, you know, decent at playing guitar. And I taught myself piano um, and just all these things. So I, I have this musical background and this, this thing where I'm always trying to strive and learn to get really good, right? Now I actually took those skills into the into the military because I wanted to be like I wanted to get paid for playing music and musicians don't make good money because there's too many of them. Yeah. And if you want to if you want to you know make millions, it's literally just a matter of luck, right? Because there's a lot of good musicians that are just as good as you. Um, so your chances of actually making money playing music is pretty darn slim. So, right. But however, you could audition and you could join a military band and now you're a musician. You get paid to do it. And I thought, okay, well, if that's the easiest way to keep getting paid for this, I'm going to do that. <laughs> but I really quickly realized that it wasn't fun. Right. They, <laughs> that, yeah. they took something that you, you can enjoy elsewhere in life and then you find yourself doing the same thing over and over and over every day the same mm -hmm. tunes and you're, and there's some silly stuff this is going to sound really funny like you you go to old retirement homes va hospitals mm -hmm. and you're playing music for these really old people who have hearing aids in and they can't even hear what the heck's going on anyway and you're playing sitting there yeah. playing music and it's yeah. it's like it's it's dumb <laughs> yeah, um waste of time but so I literally had to get out of that. I was like, all right, I'm done with this. I'm going to keep playing music, but what else can I find? And I, I looked at a whole bunch of options. And I literally landed on becoming a Green Beret. I wanted to do something, the most extreme thing I could possibly do to keep me excited and learning and doing something important. Um, and I went through Has nothing to do with music, though, right? That didn't Nothing incorporate your music. Okay, got it. Got it. Not a single thing. Not a yeah. single thing. Right. <clears throat> so I became a special forces Green Beret um, in in the army over a, a long. There's a long process to go through that. Yeah. And I went to an operational team, and I went to. Uh, I've been through all sorts of uh, training and deployments, uh, free fall training. Uh, in fact, I became a jump master as well. You know, oh. you set up drop zones and yeah. you organize jumps where people jump out of airplanes and you, you actually go up in the airplanes and you, you go through some procedures and you send them out of the door. Right. Um, so I did. Do you, Jesse, yeah. do you know how many times you've jumped? Like they keep count. Don't don't you guys keep count of that? Like I've done. Yeah, so yeah. so I've, I've got less um, static line jumps where you have where the shoe comes out automatically. Than I do uh -huh. free fall jumps, right? So, if I had to guess, static line jumps would probably be like ninety something static line jumps. Hmm. I don't think and I crested a hundred static line jumps because, like, it was pretty soon that I went to free fall school, and then I was a free fall guy. So and you're over two hundred at least. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And is there any type of anything else you've done in your life that's given you that type of adrenaline no, rush? No, so it's not all adrenaline rush. But I mean, there's certainly are a lot of them. But there's some, like it kept my brain occupied a lot, right? Because you find yourself in challenging situations all over the world where you literally have to solve problems. Um, right. Not just, you know, through combat action and violence and stuff, but you literally have to solve other people's problems. There's logistical issues with um, getting vehicles and food um, to these uh, these people in a third world country that you're trying to train. But all, simultaneously, 
you don't really trust these people and they don't really trust you, but you're trying to hold these meetings with them and come to some common ground so that they can work with you and you can train them to go fight some bad guys, right? So there's yeah. like, it's literally like playing chess. Um, and you got to stay on your toes. Um, and there's just a lot of stuff going on. It really keeps your brain occupied. It's not always the safest of, uh, of course, it's, there's dangerous situations when you're yeah. special forces guy. But um, it, how many years did you do? Fifteen years. Fifteen, you said? So then after that, um, I, I came into crypto. Crypto, like you hear a lot of guys in our community say they came, came into crypto in like 2017 for some reason. In the yeah. Pulse Chain community, like if you ask somebody, like nine times out of ten, for some reason they're going to say 2017. Um, Why do you think that is? I mean, I don't know. I came I know. in. I came. I actually came in uh, uh, January. It was like my birthday. It was a little bit after, but I came in. I saw a magazine on a desk and of course Bitcoin was at like 20 K Christmas, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I'd actually been listening to Richard for a little bit, but that magazine was what got me in and it took a while for me to get the money on as I had to learn how to do it with Coinbase and everything. So I was, uh, uh my birthday's in January, mid January. So anyways, it was actually 2018 January, but yeah. Um, what, yeah, why do you think that is? Uh, sorry to cut you off. I don't know why it's all, all like a lot of that's around in that time frame in our community, but <clears throat> I'd say about 2017, uh, um, I started looking at crypto as well. Um, maybe, maybe it was 2018. I had actually bought Bitcoin long before that, uh, but I also sold long before that, so I didn't like I didn't I didn't know what I had earlier. Yeah. Um, and I participated in um, a variety of things, right? I bought the hype, the coins that were hype, the ones that were at the top, you know, it, it displayed themselves on Coinbase or whatever. It was like, oh, this one must be good. And you just buy some random thing, right, without really fully understanding it. And I started to get into some leveraged trading platforms because uh, I didn't know better. Um, but the way my mind works, I actually figured out, you know, okay, here's how, okay, this is what, um, you know, this is what a short squeeze kind of looks like with this chart. Okay, it's going to break out of this. It has to break out of this. At some, and I kind of figured out a little bit of chart reading. And I'm not suggesting that anybody uh, trade off of charts, right? Because you're just going to lose all your money. Um, I actually made a little bit of money. I'm doing it. And then um, somewhere along the lines, I I stumbled across Richard Hart and I found Hex and I thought it was a scam, but then I came back, back and I bought well below a penny, uh, which was, uh, you know, about a year, well. year. Yeah, year I, in or something. Yeah, I did I did pretty well with that. And I'd say so, yeah. <laughs> um, I am staked and I have, um, I certainly have taken some profits, but I'm staked. Um, as well, I believe in it long term that it can be, you know, successful, and other people will come in and buy some, and stake it, and stuff. Um, <clears throat> and I saw um, Richard explain th things very thoroughly, like when he would get up and he would explain or get in a debate with somebody. Mm -hmm. um, people would say he, he always wins, and that's because he knows what he's talking about. And, I was like, you know what? And I kind of know where Richard's coming from on that because I do things the same way. Like I'll get into um, something and I will wrap my head around it completely until, until I fully understand it and can explain it to somebody else in my sleep. And I wanted to learn how liquidity pools work. And I wanted to learn how stable coins work. And I wanted to learn, well, what's actually going on in the exchanges? How does the money flow in? Uh, uh, what happens if um, you know things are under collateralized? What happens if an FTX happens? And there's right. right, and I literally had to figure out every little thing 
that I possibly can that makes all of this crypto world function. And I don't feel uh, filled or complete unless I understand it. Yeah. And hey, so Jesse, let me, sorry, just let me cut you off for a sec. It's cutting in and out really bad. It has been for a little bit, but I thought it would come back. Um, can I boot you out real quick and have you come back in? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Let me try this. All right. Say something. Something. Yep. That's way better. Keep going. Sorry. All right. So, yeah, I just strive to learn everything I possibly can. And I can't keep my mouth shut because when I learn something, I usually get so excited about it. I want other people to know it, too. I love so. that about the the this community. I feel like I thought it was a crypto thing, and I actually don't think that anymore because I as I've been, especially the last three months, as I've been trying to, my goal with this channel is to share what I love about pulse and richard and even things that some of the hexagons don't like i think that uh although it may not be great for price temporarily i think zen may be a good uh onboarding tool and anyways right. i want to share these things with people and let them make up their own mind but i also want to realize that i like v3 liquidity providing there's a guy who's been in crypto way shorter than me that made these great videos and made me realize, Hey, I should be doing this. Like I, I I'm just staking minded. I can balance out just like, you know, you don't want to have all your eggs in one basket for what you own. Well, mm -hmm. I now took that mentality of coin ownership and diversifying your assets to, well, my, instead of just staking 100%, I'm going to, diversify that action into a little bit of v3 um lp or liquidity providing mm -hmm. so i can control the ranges and everything anyways i love that about because the vast majority of this community is they learn something and they get on and especially the hex community they encourage people to create channels there's a lot about like maddie i i think maddie allen is great there's some things i disagree with him about especially recently but He's always encouraging people to get on and share. And so that's one thing I've loved about you, you guys specifically over at Power City, but you as as well, because I, I didn't know any of the other guys on the Power City team. Um, I, I just hadn't come across them. I don't know how active they were. But uh, yeah, it's it's been amazing to see how this community is very much, you know, wanting to share what they learn. Right. So I had to change my name to just Seth Jesse. Because, yeah, it's like but that's not because I know everything. It's just because, um, if you have a question, uh, you know that if Jesse does know it, he's gonna tell you, right? And so, yeah. uh, that's you know that's why I changed my name to that because I literally want to share everything I learned with everybody else because I want them to know the same thing. It's fair. When did the a, a fair system? When like, did like there's some things that happen in Uniswap V3 that people don't fully understand is happening right underneath their, you know, right in front of them. And it's important that people understand how to read liquidity pools when they make a decision to buy or sell a coin. You should probably not only go off of the price, uh, but go look at Uniswap V3 and look at both sides of the pool, see how thick they are. And, you know, there's reasons for all that. Um, mm -hmm. It kind of matches up with the cycles. So you can really figure out if something's being manipulated or not being manipulated by just reading the USB three pools and the weighting on each side. And I, I sometimes I get a whole hour long class and do, do that, right? Because people, it protects people when they fully understand what what, what people are capable of in the markets. Um, if all you believe is a narrative, uh, low liquidity moves this. Is an example. Yeah. Low liquidity makes price example. Low liquidity makes price move the hardest. That's a half truth. 
And it's a half truth because that only applies to half the liquidity pool. So if you go to Uniswap V3 and you've got a current price and it says below the current price, there's, a, we'll say, a 1 million USDC coins. And above the current price, there's 15 million ER dollars worth of the other ERC-20. Um, and then you say, oh, it's a $16 million pool. That's pretty low liquidity. Um, price must move the hardest. It's going to go up fast. Okay, no, you're wrong. You've got more value above the price than you do below. You've only got a million dollars below. You've got $15 million above that you have to eat through for the price to go up. So that narrative only applies in one direction. Price moves, you, so you could literally say low liquidity. What does that even mean? Uh, because you can have high liquidity on one side and low liquidity on the other, or low liquidity on the side and vice versa. So you can't just believe this simple narrative. You have to dive in and look at it yourself. Yeah, nuance. Everything is nuanced. If if you go just a little bit beneath the surface, and I like that. That's a very very simple good example. Because when you said that, I was like, yeah, that's true. And I was trying to think of an example, but that's exactly right. You, it, and just the amount of people that don't realize. And I, it, I probably was two years that I was into crypto before I realized if there's a certain amount of liquidity that has to get eaten through before the price can get past it. And that, that, yeah. that's kind of a basic thing, but I didn't know that. And so in order to try to have any idea what the price is going to do in crypto, you have to have an idea of liquidity and what it means and where it's at. And what, what are we talking about when it like, right. what is right. the other side? Right. Because it, it will be totally different for DAI and for USDC. Right. And your hex or whatever. I've been thinking a lot about lately is like, these exchanges and like, like FTX just running off with everyone's money and stuff. And it's simple to now to at least assume that when bad stuff happens in crypto, it's very volatile for the markets and there's a lot of dumping. But why? Like there's, I had to understand why it actually is. When an exchange loses their money, is everyone selling off their coins because they're worried it's going to happen again. No, that's not actually what's happening at all. Um, are they worried that if they're holding it over here, that all oh, FTX got stolen from our stuff over here is going to it's going to happen? Like, no, that's not why the sell-offs occur at all. I had to why think is that happening then? I had to think really, really hard, and that's why. This is a zero sum game. There's no doubt. There's no doubt in my mind that all of crypto is a zero sum game. All other investments are also the same way. Mm -hmm. Let me give an example. One US dollar goes into an exchange somewhere to purchase a piece of crypto. All right. The only thing available, no matter what happens in this ecosystem of crypto no matter what if somebody wants a dollar of back out for any one of these cryptos in the giant ecosystem a crypto has to go back to that exchange and there is a dollar available and that dollar can come back up now if there's lots of dollars coming in from different exchanges okay um and they're selling these cryptos. Um, even if there's a minting function of USDC and it's fully not redeemable and all that, like, and then that USDC is used to purchase a crypto, it's still the same. You have USDC coming into a liquidity pool, for example, on Uniswap, and it's purchasing a token out of that pool. But the only thing available to ever get back out is that when USDC, when a, when a token comes back, can, you know, everything literally is what's, what comes in, reweights a pool somewhere, somebody gets something else, 
hey, later on, if somebody wants to swap back, they can get back the thing that they with. We just lost him. Dang it. Sorry, lost you. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah everything. The actual, yeah, the actual value in crypto, uh, the actual extractable USD value, doesn't magically appear out of nowhere. It has to be brought in, and then that's what's able to come out. Now, <clears throat> when an exchange runs off with everyone's money, you now have all these cryptos that have gone up in value because they pumped, whether through its the rating, rating in the liquidity pools, uh, you know, the ratios, and, and moved various cryptos up in price or whatever. But now when all the money is gone off in an exchange, billions of dollars instantly disappear because one guy stole it and ran off with it. That's the condition where people, the smart guys, and the whales who have smart guys working for them, the institutions who hold a lot of these cryptos on various um, platforms, um, the circles of the world and the black rocks of the world, right? Right. They realize, wow, now we literally encrypt though that much is, is unable to get out because one asshole ran off with it and that's going to be tied up in court for a really long time and we may never see that money come back in. So they literally adjust their positions accordingly and they say, well, we better sell this down before other people do because that money's not available if we're the last ones out of the door. And then people literally sell to get the, you know, to, to be first, because if you're last, you're literally left holding the bag because that guy took all the money, right? So there's a lot of that in the crypto, a lot of that. Now, that's not the, the only reason things go through these big giant cycles. They don't all come crashing down because the exchange got hacked. That's not the, the only reason. The other reason is because of, simply because of the way sometimes these market caps get unrationally um, disproportional to what's actually available to get out. So when you have um, a U.S. dollar, uh, it has infinite liquidity. Right. You can buy anything you want with a U.S. dollar, and, and um, conversely, anything can be sold for, for U.S. You can buy a billion dollars for the bubble gum if you wanted to, right? And it doesn't yep. really, like, it's got infinite liquidity. And people People can complain all the time. Crypto maxis can complain and say, oh, but the dollar is going to zero. Uh, and it's like, you're funny. There's more to it than that. It has infinite liquidity. Crypto does not. Right? So Bitcoin has really, really, really thick liquidity. Right? It does. It's, it's located all yeah. over the place. It's on all these different exchanges. It moves very, very slowly. You can dump a lot of it or buy a lot of it. It doesn't move that much. And, and it's over time, it's actually becoming closer and closer and closer to the stip. I'm not going to say it's stable. It still goes through price movements. Um, right. But uh, it's it more like the stock market. Yeah. It's getting ever, ever, ever increasingly less volatile year after year. Right. So it may, right. may have a 50 or 60 percent dip. Well, in the early days, it would have a 70 or 80 before that it had a 90 percent like over time yeah. as networks of things grow the dips become less and less and less when you start to get into super low liquidity coins um, um which what you'll find is like a, a coin that has like 50 billion dollar market cap just as an example and then you might go to a liquidity pool and there's like two hundred thousand dollars now you have fifty. You have all these people thinking that, that you know, as a whole, as a community, each person thinks they have a bunch of money, but the price just keeps going wildly up and down. And the actual value that can never come out is actually really, really small, right? Right. So that becomes an issue. So some people say, well, can you make a stable coin back by the collateral of, um, you know, a little coin? Um, whether the, um, you know, let's just say that's text, for example. 
Mm -hmm. I'm not saying there's other things that can't be done with X, but maybe a state point is not the smartest thing to do. Let me give you an example. $15 billion market cap. Uh, you certainly can't sell that much. Um, I don't know, $5 million, $7 million, $20 million worth of liquidity and all the pools combined. Okay. okay. Now, let's just say you're allowed that to be a, a collateralized asset for stable coins. And now some people come in and they're like, oh, sweet, we can just get stable coins out and we can get our money out. So now you see a billion dollars worth of tax get locked into the vaults and they, these people mint a stable coin. You got a billion dollars, you got a billion stable coins. And yes, it's true. Each and every one of them is fully backed and redeemable for a dollar worth of tax. Mm -hmm. But we still have these super low liquidity pools for hex, and there's ne there's more value in the stable coins than it is an actual thing that collateralizes themselves. You have these stable coins, and the actual value that could ever come out is significantly less, right? And it does it, it gets into a really dangerous situation because somebody can easily move those prices around. Yeah. Or are you after? Are, are you worried about Hex and the, like, kind of what you're describing? Uh, again, you you like Hex. I like Hex. Little disclaimer out of the way. But I'm not afraid to talk about certain things. There are certain things that I wonder about. I'm not going to say bother me. But what you're describing kind of seems like, if not a problem, maybe a misconception. Things that need to be understood better so we can work with the ecosystem and the coin better are you do you have concerns with what you're referencing right now in regards to hex so it's different so oh okay so, How so? so you could say that it has very excellent price performance but sometimes price performance comes at the cost of that performance being paper gains for the majority of the people. Does yeah. That make sense? With that, that the makes sense. That the price performance and the charts will make more people come in. Uh, so is it is it actually better to have better price performance or is it actually better to have Less run up in price, but thicker and deeper liquidity. Uh, it, depends. It, it depends. <laughs> it depends, but, but it depends on how many of those people are actually looking to get some value out of them. Uh, a healthy ecosystem to me is the guy. Right? Yes. Yeah. Some sort of. And can we paint that with a ratio across all points? Can we make a ratio that shows um, okay Bitcoin has a ratio of across all the available pools and the current um, you know order books this is what the market shows as being available for buyer for sale and the total market cap of the coin shows it's got X valuation in comparison to that um, and then you can say, wow, there's tons and tons of coins in existence, or there's barely enough any coins. You, know, you get this ratio between the two of those things. Um, and that will show you the accessibility of a coin. Or maybe it's more the feasibility of something to be collateralized. Right? So, you know, I think a lot about I think a lot about these things. Right now, I, I just kind of explained why you wouldn't want to collateralize hex for a, to make a stable coin. It, right. There's, but what about a native coin of a chain like ETH or something, right? Or even if it was something like PulseX or something like Pulse, where, oh, okay, well, you've got these liquidity pools paired to thousands of other things. Um, and it's like tens or hundreds of millions of dollars worth of liquidity. You know, all these pairings and staking rules never else, and it's carried on this exchange. And it's like you add all that up, 
They're like, oh wow, that's a lot. Okay, this actually makes sense. People can mint a stable coin against that. Um, and then you've got the total supply of these stable coins that's, that's probably less than the total market cap of the um, the thing that's being collateralized. So, so see how that was backwards from the previous example? The previous example right. with X, you had like, or the X is ability, right? Not, so you, with Hex, you had, had more stable coins minted than were actual available liquidity to exit in the pools, right? But maybe right. something like Pulse or with Pulse X or with E. What you have is you have X amount of stable coins that are minted and all the different ability of the coin and the X points of liquidity pools across the system are actually way more than the amount of stable points that are made. Now, you can't necessarily ever know for sure what the ratio between those two things is going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, but the deeper, thicker, lots of activity, lots of market participant things that spread across lots of places will normally work itself out. And that's why Ave picks up, you, you know, you know, all the blue chip coins. And you can put the blue chip cryptos in the and, and platforms against them. Um, that's why right, there's other lending platforms that you can pick up the blue chip deep liquidity stuff and you can collateralize against stuff. So when you take a liquidity forward, you literally can just say, is, is this a blue chip thing? Oh, cool. It was made by Richard Hart. It's got a huge ecosystem, you know, 150,000 users and wallets and and all this perceived value that, that you know people had sacrificed and such. And then you say, oh, yeah, that's for sure a blue chip. It meets all these various parameters. This is a perfect thing to collateralize. Let's do it. What in your in your opinion, if you were to name let just your opinion, if you were to go and do that, what would be uh just three or four blue chips? I mean, probably some of the obvious, but would you count uh a Pulsex that has such a strong community and so much money, or would you is there any element of performance that you would have to see? Or is it just strictly the numbers of the people in the community, the dollars that were sacrificed, what would you count as blue chips? Like which well, coins? I mean, you could ask the same question about Pulse itself, right? We, nobody ever knows the performance of any of these things until they exist. Right. But you can kind of gauge how big the community is. Um, you can look at, I mean, the strength of a network is what makes the best. So you go on. The, the, the network of, of a, the user base of any blockchain is what makes the price go on. The larger the user base, the more people are excited and the network effect. Um, that's literally what that's literally what causes things to go up. It's, it, yeah. it's not because any one founder created it and because that guy created it, the price is going to go up. You have to look at the excitement from the community. Right. Um, I, I think that is actually one of the things that, that sometimes the more, um, I'll throw myself into this boat, but sometimes the people who are more small business minded, maybe haven't had as much success as Richard Hart, but have had some success and maybe are a little bit more driven to be, you know, humble because that's, you know, you're taught, Hey, be humble, work hard. These are the principles that will lead you to su success in life. And that have mm -hmm. also been things that Richard Hart has talked about. It, it's one of the things, um, that, uh, bothers me sometimes and I, I just got to let it go and I and I do a pretty good job of that but the 27 million raised for charity was him doing a good job being the figurehead and finding and making a good relationship um, with the Sins Foundation right. but it was the community and when th there were issues with the May launch getting delayed 
I didn't care about the individuals. It was actually what worried me about the health of the project, that being Pulse Chain, was how I got upset with the people who really wanted to know about updates. And that I felt like the people who were the most concerned at the beginning um, were the average people. But then as you went out a month or two, you had random people who are going to be impatient, and that's just par for the course. But it was people who were building, or at least that's how what it felt like to me on Twitter. Um, who knows how real that is? But I'm getting to my question because you are building. You've been a part of two huge projects that I think are going to be huge for the price performance of Pulse and Pulse X. Um, and so my question is, did, did you have the same type of, maybe you don't like the word frustration, but uh, concern when it was, hey, Richard, let's focus more on the community for one reason, just to communicate so we can get all these projects that are trying to build on Pulse Chain and launch when Pulse Chain goes live eventually, and it will, but we want it to be as healthy as quickly as possible. And if there is no communication and it goes live tomorrow, you guys are not going to launch in 30 days. It'll take 60 when otherwise maybe it could have been in 30 days or, or maybe I'm referring to liquid loans. But anyways, what are your thoughts on, on that? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Is the communication really that big of a deal? <clears throat> Am I putting you in a bad spot? <laughs> no, you're not. Okay. He, look, he's a weird guy. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, I do think that he means well. I, I think agree. he wants the chain to succeed. Um, I do think, think sometimes he has the tunnel. They don't know what's right and wrong or about what what success might look like. Mm -hmm. You know, what does success look like? Um, you know, two things on the chain and no builder just except him and but the only thing you have is, a, is X a bridge S swapping platform and VLS platform. You phone. said that. <laughs> um, okay. So here let me let me put the so what do you hold on? Let me let me boot you out because you're you're frozen. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah. And then have you my, again. my thing's overheating. It's, it's, is it? We can yeah. uh, we can round can up. In, let's let's. With, uh, I can jump in with, with a different uh, device. Just give okay. me one I'll, second. I'll, do you want me to wait to boot you out? No, just yeah, I'll come back in with the same link. Okay, cool.